Beyond the Fence Line, a podcast brought to you by the Texas Agricultural Land Trust. Created by landowners for landowners, we're proud to play a role in conserving the Texas legacy of wide open spaces. Hi, I'm Hannah Blankenship, TALT's Stewardship Manager. Each conservation easement at TALT is tailored to meet each individual landowner's unique wishes. This may be to utilize the property for farming or livestock production, or to delineate a specific area for future building. I work to ensure these requests are upheld through annual monitoring. It is important to have support from individuals like you to continue our work here at TALT. If you haven't already, please donate to us today at www.txaglandtrust.org slash support. Well, welcome to Beyond the Fence Line. This is Chad Ellis, the CEO of Texas Ag Land Trust. And uh, it's good to be back in the seat and, and uh, getting to host uh, this, this month. Um, hopefully everyone's got to enjoy the last couple of um, episodes with some of the staff and really kind of diving further into the easements on the monitoring side. And then also last month's kind of the 101 on conservation easements. But today we're gonna to kind of pivot and really kind of talk about, you know, the kind of the buzz that we're hearing around, around carbon markets. And we've talked a number of times, um, you know, on this podcast about, you know, our ecosystem service markets and, and really, uh, kind of focus today more around the carbon markets. And when we kind of think about it from a landowner's perspective, right, it's a little bit confusing. We got, we're seeing more and more uh, marketplaces um, popping up each and every day. You know, it, it's, it's hard to understand, right? It's, you don't know what you don't know. And what we really feel at TALT is tr- sort of being that hub of a resource, you know, for our, our landowners. And we really feel that Landowners really need tools to help them navigate, you know, through these complex um, contracts, especially on that side of these um, marketplaces. And uh, joined today is uh, Anson Howard, um, attorney by day there at Oil Fitzsimmons and rancher by night, as I like to say, um, there in Dimmitt and Tom Green County. Um, and he's going to help us kind of talk about you know, what the landowners needs uh, to know to navigate through these carbon markets. And Anson, I really appreciate you joining us today. Absolutely, Chad. Happy to be on and really appreciate the resource that TALT and a lot of the other partners, uh, Noble and Texas Grazing Lands Coalition, A&M, have been as we dive into uh, this new and fascinating opportunity for landowners. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking to forward to our conversation and, and uh, just kind of talking through this and, and helping our other fellow, uh, you know, land, land stewards across the state um, kind of navigate through this, you know, and we started kind of thinking about this podcast. I mean, you were the one that popped in my mind, Anson. I mean, you're really the perfect guest for us today because, you know, you have a lot of this relevant experience to help helping landowners think through um, contracts, right, from oil and gas leases to, to, you know, what you've been diving into on these carbon market contracts. Uh, you know, you're one of a handful of attorneys in Texas really navigating through these, these carbon contracts. And, you know, you're a landowner and rancher yourself. So you really understand these unique needs of our, our producers across the state. And you've actually entered into a contract yourself. And, you know, I'd love to kind of dive into that. You know, what what has been your experience that led you to kind of take away from this, you know, and, and takeaways really from this um, carbon space? Absolutely. So my experience thus far has been, it's been a wonderful process that, We'll talk about it more later, but that really goes back to who you're partnering with that's the broker for your soil carbon storage contract. And the takeaway on it is that this is a new, rapidly evolving area. Uh, There's a tremendous amount that we still don't know about the science. And so just like with any new opportunity, there are advantages and disadvantages to being an early participant. And that's why I think it's so important that these landowners really fully understand 
both what the contract says and what their long-term goals are with the property so that we can make sure that there are no unintended or unanticipated consequences. Yeah, I think also, Anson, kind of what I'm interested in too is kind of your your thoughts, right, of your operation, especially kind of let's kind of think about your Tom Green County, you know, ranch that you're looking at and, you know, how, you know, how this carbon market kind of helped fit into your goals and kind of some of your thought process there. Yeah, it was thrilled to have it come along. We transitioned the ranch from sort of set stocking in 2018 to, um, I want to say we, you know, help the family, but support the family, but really uh, the majority of the work and the vision has been our ranch manager, Sam Reese. And we did it because we, our goal at the ranch is to, we've got the head springs of the South Concha river and our goal is to keep those springs flowing. And we knew the way to do that or as far as we aware is to restore the rangelands to healthy climax grass species. So, you know, your big four, your Indian grass, switch grass, Eastern gamma, big blue stem. And our tool to do that is livestock, um, predominantly cow-calf operation. And so really in 2019, we started putting the plan together. 2020, we, we've got basically a five phase plan to put in the water, and fencing to enable that us to have transition the ranch from 11 primary pastures raising in size from a couple hundred acres to 1800 acres and to about 25 to 30 acre paddocks uh, that we transition the herd through uh, with daily moves that size of paddocks vary uh, herd size varies there are a lot of variables that go in there but that's sort of the overall and at the time, we didn't know that there was going to be this opportunity for soil carbon storage markets. That really came into play last this time last year, a year ago. Um, but we knew that there, just by doing these practices, there would be opportunities for ecosystem services. And this is the soil carbon storage market has been the first one. And to us, it really went along perfectly with where we were because we in transitioning to this regenerative grazing model, we wanted the science to us is very important in documenting what we're doing uh, so that we can determine whether or not we're actually making a difference. And, you know, we think these practices are the right ones, but we've got to grade ourselves. And if they're not, we're, we need to make a transition sooner rather than later. And so one of the tools that we were using to measure how we were doing is doing baseline soil samples. And, but those soil samples, you got to collect them, take a soil sample a meter deep, ship them off to the laboratory. It was costing uh, a couple thousand dollars a year. Enters the soil carbon storage broker and says, hey, we want to enroll your property. and We will do all the baseline soil sampling. We were able to negotiate a contract in which the broker completely covers that cost. The landowner's never out of pocket any cost. And to me, that was huge. I'm for the ranch. I mean, if somebody yeah. asked what my real reason for doing it was, we got tens of thousands of dollars in sold uh, data that we didn't have to pay for. Right. Yeah, it's a perfect fit for you. I mean, it fit your goals and objective and it kind of, you know, layered in nicely. And as you said, you know, you were committed to do this baseline to kind of know, you know, where you are and where you're going. And, you know, just that aspect was enough for you to, you know, kind of essentially uh, jump in and and uh, kind of learn, you know, maybe the hard way uh, for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, but that's not really how we want other landowners to have to kind of learn this new space. As you said, it's, it's kind of emerging and it's new. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's kind of from, from Paul's perspective, right? Is, you know, we're looking at, you know, how do, you know, how can we get more information out there and tools to, you know, into the landowners to help make the best sound decision for them. And, uh, you know, with that, we kind of started thinking about, you know, we have all of these marketplaces coming and we really wanted to bring kind of those trusted sources and the, that, those resource um, kind of hubs of information from our landowners perspective. And, you know, we kind of hosted a small group, um, I guess, 
what it's been Anson a month or two ago. And um, with Noble Research Institute and Texas Grazing Land Coalition and Texas A&M uh, Extension and the Texas A&M Natural Resource Institute and yourself um, for us to kind of start thinking about, you know, how can we um, kind of develop a, a tool of that really is kind of the, the key questions to ask, right? And, uh, you know, we really are great that we were able to all come together and, and put that tool out there. Um, and we took, you know, experience, um, it, you know, it took, you know, all of our experiences to really develop a series of questions for these landowners. And we really leaned on you of kind of some of your past experiences and thoughts of, you know, wearing your uh, rancher hat and then wearing your tie as well from a lawyer perspective of other ranchers you've helped and kind of walk through this. Um, so I really like for us to just sort of dive in um, and really kind of talk about this uh, evaluation tool that we kind of developed. It was great to have all those different stakeholders in the room collaborating to put this together. And you know, it's what we were seeing is a lot of landowners were being approached by soil carbon storage groups that were offering an upfront payment and you know, in exchange for signing the boilerplate contract. And you know, that's a pretty big incentive when a rancher's looking at $15 plus per acre uh, to sign the contract. And you know, these ranchers were finding out about it from what they consider to be trusted sources a lot of times that were promoting these contracts. And so it, we realized the landowner needed to have a set of questions that they could step back and ask to really evaluate, was this potential broker going to be a good fit for them? And yeah, we put together just sort of a prioritized list that, you know, really lets the landowner determine, is this worth pursuing? Because uh, a lot of times you can, you know, before you, you know, landowners have to worry about legal costs and you can vary by determining one, is the landowner going to be ever be out of pocket any costs? And two, will the group fully, the, being the broker, fully indemnify you? The landowner can probably screen out 90% of all potential issues uh, because, you know, my recommendation is going to be the science is just still too new and not out there for the landowner to guarantee storing a certain amount of carbon. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, there's a, you know, a lot to it. And, you know, we kind of, you and I talk, it seems like on a weekly basis, you know, back and forth and, and there's always something new popping up. And uh, that's what I think it's really great about having, I would say this core group, right. That we're all, kind of in this together and learning together and sharing information. And, and more importantly, I think is there's confusion, right? Of all of the different marketplaces and all the things coming about it. Um, but I think one thing that I'm really excited about is that we have all this alignment from, you know, these trusted resources where we can be consistent on our message of trying to, you know, help landowners think through the process and, you know, make the best sound decision for them of, you know, is it the right thing and which, you know, partner is that right partner. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, Texas A&M and Noble and Texas Grazing Land Coalition um, for all stepping up and working together with us. Um, you know, one, one key thing just to kind of get the listeners to know, I mean, we have it on our, our website, Texas Ag Land Trust website. If you go to our website, you can click on our work and then click under ecosystem services. And we have a, you know, a lot of in information right there for you around these ecosystem service markets. And um, right there, you'll kind of notice a soil carbon 101 um, uh, pamphlet that we're, that Ants and I are talking about today. So, you know, Anson, I guess, you know, a little bit further, you know, so the, the base basics of what these markets essentially are asking land, land, landowners to commit to, um, you know, what are, what are they being asked to do and, you know, for how long? I hate to say it, but the answer is it depends. <laughs> Every contract is different. I can tell you the contracts that 
I've been a part of negotiating and that I advise landowners to sign uh, or not going to restrict a landowner from continuing their range management practices. And a lot of these brokers realize that, that you know, every property is different and the rancher knows best how to use the tools to manage their property. Um, but you know, to, to take a big global picture, really what these contracts are asking the landowner to do at a minimum is to not destroy the soil and put a different and rather to enhance the soil. So put it in a different way is they're essentially a no sod busting clause in these contracts that the landowner you know, can't come in and plow up uh, the soil because indisputably that's going to reduce the that's going to release all the carbon into the atmosphere beyond that you see these contracts range from sometimes the brokers paying the landowner to do certain practices on the land such as to fertilize and to you know, put seed down in the thoughts that that will grow, create more vegetation that will store more carbon. Uh, questionable whether or not that actually works. Certainly, you know, well, we can have a different conversation about that. And I would really encourage the landowner to uh, run the numbers and look at what they're signing up for before committing any of those contracts. But the, you know, I think what all soil carbon storage groups really would like to see and uh, what has been proven is that regenerative land management practices uh, by using livestock and potentially some uh, other land management tools are what's going to help improve that soil to store that carbon. And the second part of your question, you know, how long are these contracts? On the timber side, you see contracts for as short as a year, uh, but on the rangeland side where we're, you know, primarily seeing the majority of these contracts, they tend to be a total of 15 year fi contract, five years for the soil carbon storage broker to sell that, those soil carbon storage credits. And then the landowner commits to storing that soil carbon as in not dist disturbing uh, that soil for an additional 10 years after each year that's sold. So year five being the final year plus 10 years of storage gives you a 15 year contract. Right. So, you know, how does, you know, how do these contracts really in, impact these obligations? And kind of secondly, can you, can you end a contract early? I think you're going to give me the old Texas tech answer. I think. <laughs> uh, I'll skip that one and I'll just answer the easiest one first. Can you end the contract early? <laughs> <laughs> don't recommend it. Um, yeah. And that's why it's so important to, so yes, you can end the contract early. It's a contract and you can break the contract, but in doing so, the land, uh, you've got to, as we're going to talk about, this is a bit of, these contracts are a bit of a partnership, uh, more so than a lot of contracts. Um, right. There's really a heavy role. You know, a lot of times when we see contracts on the landowner side, it's an oil and gas lease. Right. The oil company is doing almost all the work. Uh, the landowners, really what the oil company wants the landowner to do is stay out of the way. Same thing with a pipeline easement or solar easement or you know, almost all the other contracts dealing with land. It's a company that's acquired the contract wants the landowner to stay out of the way. That is not the case here. The carbon broker really wants the landowner to be fully committed to doing everything possible to store that carbon. And as a result of that, the sort of give and take is that if the landowner for some reason says, hey, I'm gonna get out of this early, then depending on the contract, the brokers incurred significant measurement costs and right. cost brokering this. And the broker themselves have a contract with the buyer for the sale of this carbon. So if the landowner gets out at, at a minimum, the landowners, what we're seeing is typically on the hook for the cost of storage, the, uh, for the carbon that was sold plus the measurement cost. Um, so yeah, for those re reasons, don't recommend it. And then, you know, with regard to your second question, um, what's the landowner really being asked to do? Um, that sort of ties back into 
the you know at a minimum not disturbing the soil carbon but after that as much as possible to execute land management practices that are going to improve the soil health and it's really important to remember that you know a lot of times we focus on the surface of the property you know these measurements go down three feet what's hap is texas grazing lands Co coalition calls it it's the herd beneath the soil that matters and it's all these microorganisms that and these processes that are occurring beneath the soil that we're really trying to foster to store for that carbon yeah no, those are great points i, I think anson is that you know you really got to be committed from that active management and be willing to you know try new practices and new things to to uh, try to increase the carbon right to to get paid for so it's it's not kind of a passive type of a situation where you can just keep doing what you've always done in a lot of cases um you know it does take take that extra step in these contracts um you know, when we kind of think about it too, I guess another question that kind of comes up is, you know, can, you know, on that topic of thinking about carbon sequestration, can you be paid in excess over additional carbon store than what they predict if you store more? Yes, once again, it goes back to the terms of the contract. So you really see two different types of contracts. You see one that just, says, hey, landowner, I'm gonna pay you a base price based on what we estimate the value of the carbon credits to be right now and how much we estimate the landowner's gonna store. So say for example, you know, right now, carbon, uh, one metric ton of carbon credits trading for around $22 per metric ton in the US. And, and you estimate, let's just take Gulf Coast land, uh, it tends to have the, some of the highest soil carbon storage it's around you know four anticipated because the science is still very new but anticipated let's just call it somewhere around two metric tons per acre on land that's being regeneratively grazed and so the soil carbon storage broker says all right landowner we're going to pay you based on uh, a percentage of that estimate well and then the broker gets to capture any upside if the landowner stores more. So that really goes back to could the brokers very much relying on the landowner to store more. And the landowner has no incentive to store more because the contract doesn't allow them to get paid any extra either in price or in storage. The contracts that I think really work well are more of a profit sharing mm -hmm. agreement where the land owner gets 80% of the sales price, broker gets 20%, and, you know, it's contracts, those terms can vary, but some such uh, fairly similar percentage. And then the landowner's very much incentivized to store more than is predicted. And the landowner gets to participate in any upside in that soil carbon storage sale price. The broker's also incentivized to go out and market that contract for the maximum possible amount because they're going to participate in the added revenue yeah no excellent you know i think you you know the burning question really is uh you know we get all the time is really focused around the compensation and you just kind of really talked about you know, kind of what those prices are around that you know you mentioned that 22 dollars per metric ton but i think that's the key thing to keep in mind is you know that's not per acre right that's per metric ton of carbon stored um you know and some of our landscapes right across the state you know we go from very dry to wet um you know and and it all really depends on the soil as well and and rainfall and you know some of our rangelands you know say and and you know out west in the rolling plains etc um you know answer we're kind of really looking at a lot of times it may be a uh, you know, a half a uh, half a ton, you know, per acre that that you're going to be able to store. Um, so you kind of start putting that in the, in the equation, as you mentioned in the Gulf Coast region. You know, they're it's just set up perfect for them to be able to store more carbon um, easier. Um, any any other thoughts else on your on your end there? From a contract perspective, 
you know, I mean, you get the landowner definitely doesn't want to cap themselves at the amount that their soil carbon can be sold for. You know, yep. for example, you know, when we signed up last year, the going rate was sixteen dollars and fifty cents per metric ton. Now it's around twenty-two. In Europe, which has a government-regulated uh, yep. soil carbon market that's really a driving factor. Whereas in the U.S., it's you know, private industry and really trying to meet those environmental and social uh, governance standards (ESG). The so the U.S. market, because it's not government regulated, is around twenty-two. But that European twenty-two dollars per metric ton of carbon. The European market is around eighty dollars per metric ton. And but there's the opportunity for landowners that participate in soil carbon storage projects. If they meet all the right requirements and Europe follows a VERA standard, which goes back to the Kyoto protocols, but there's no reason the US landowner can't sell into that European sure. soil carbon storage market at that greater $80 per metric ton price. Um, so there's, a, as with anything, there are a lot of options. And that would probably be my number one advice to landowners is if they're Considering this, as you and I, as you mentioned, we probably visit weekly about a new broker in this space, and there's some really neat other ecosystem services opportunities out there for these properties, and it's really worth considering all the options. And certainly, when draft a contract, we want to make sure that we limit the contract to what the landowners actually getting paid for you know, the carbon and so that that landowner can continue to participate in other ecosystem services opportunities. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point, Anson. And, and one, you, you know, how I strongly feel really it's about stacking, right. These opportunities in these other markets. So, you know, I think it starts making sense. Like you mentioned, you know, at $20, 22, dollars per metric ton on carbon but if we could also gain another you know say 20 20 dollars uh you know an acre from a you know a water market and then maybe it's another 15 or 20 dollars from a biodiversity market and um you know that's that's when we're going to start kind of stacking those benefits and i think those are key things to to make sure that those are written in those contracts that you can still stack and and have those other opportunities that you're not losing um, yeah, absolutely. One thing yeah. I might add real quick is you were talking about the range in your previous question of the soil carbon storage from the Gulf Coast, you, you know, Panhandle, a lot of West Texas, it's estimated to be around half a metric ton of carbon stored per acre per year. That's on properties that are sort of regeneratively grazed. Um, personal experience, our property was measured last year. It has not yet been verified because um, the verifier, to their credit, isn't sure that the science is there, and we certainly don't have a history of you know, regenerative grazing to you know, back up the, what we can accomplish. And so we're still waiting for that, um, which I think is great and probably one of the most important things is that the verifier really hold that standard to keep these credits marketable so that we don't have a situation where you know, people are just looking and saying, oh, this is smoke and mirrors. It's not worth buying. Right. No, I think that's key, right? And I think it comes back to your point that you keep driving home, which I think is important is, you know, the partnership of who you, who you go with, right? And um, those are all, all uh, great points. You know, I think too, the, you know, the really, the other aspect of it is landowners really must, you know, think through the expenses, you know, they may incur to truly paint the entire picture. Um, you know, what are some of those costs uh, kind of through these contracts and what's the obligations, Anson? So to be eligible, you know, for some of these soil carbon storage contracts that we're seeing, you know, it's a commitment to regenerative grazing or some mm -hmm. land management practices. And, you know, the ranchers know what their costs are to install, you know, to make that happen better than anybody. But the cost of water lines and fencing um, and then with the contract itself you've got legal fees negotiating it uh, which can range you know 
just depending on the complexity of the contract, uh, but at minimum or probably a couple thousand dollars. And then the verification and measurement costs are typically not going to be on the landowner depending on the contract, but still those get often subtracted from the payment um, so that the landowner only gets the net percentage of that. So you look at the measurement costs right now tend to vary around $8 per acre, eight to 10 measured. Um, that's just because mobilizing a team to go out and take these three foot deep soil cores uh, across to get a good representation of the property. I know on our property, it was about an average of one soil core to 70 acres. And then you've got a, every year, the verifier has to recertify the property that the land management practices are continuing and to store soil carbon. And so that's estimated to be around a dollar per acre per year. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, those, you know, all these prices, you know, I guess costs start adding up and it may not be direct out of their payment, but right. It's some of these costs are um, out of the pocket. Some are sort of absorbed within that transaction costs and, um, you know, in, in some form or fashion, it's being paid in some ways by the, the landowner. Um, you know, what about restrictions, Anson? I mean, have you seen contracts that prohibit management practices? In the sense, yes, uh, sort of what we talked about with don't destroy the soil health. Right. The, you know, so certainly no plowing. Um, most of them are all right with you know, grubbing because uh, they understand that that's a transition back to grassland. The, what on more of a you know, large landscape scale, what they want to see is that you're, not going to develop the property um, that be you know in terms of oil and gas they're sort of comfortable with two percent of the property being mm -hmm. used for oil and gas production wind production you know, limited solar production um, but any more than that you start to impact the soil carbon storage and so you know, like with a lot of these and what most landowners want to do they want to you know maximize the range benefits and minimize the you know, disturbance and so usually those could be can you know, accompany each other pretty well you know one of the other questions you know that i have and and i think you know i've seen it a little both ways is and a question we get a lot of is landowners asking you know can we still participate in you know say the natural resource conservation service like equip you know cost share programs and other things of that nature uh, what have what have you run across in some of the contracts you've reviewed? I've seen it both ways in contracts. Typically, I've seen some contracts that outright prohibit it, and other contracts that don't take a position on it. That's very something very important that the landowner needs to make sure to reserve is the right to participate in that to participate in pasture insurance, crop insurance, and to be able to back to what I said uh, about reserving the ability to participate in all those other stacking benefits. If the landowner's not getting paid for it, then the landowner should still reserve the right to participate in any other ecosystem services, you know, credits, all those opportunities. Uh, you see some of these groups that they're not, <laughs> the way they drafted their contract is, they're not sure what else is going to be out there, but they want to be able to take advantage of it. And my response is, well, until you figure out how to compensate the landowner for it, you know, it's off the table. Right, right. So the part that we don't always think about, you know, really is the legal side. And, you know, you, of course, are, are well versed in, in this. Um, can you tell us some things to consider there? Absolutely. Back to sort of the original prioritized list I look at when a landowner is considering these contracts. Number one, indemnity. You know, is the broker going to fully indemnify the landowner from all issues concerning this contract? Um, that way, you know, if for some reason the landowner doesn't store 
through no fault of the landowner's own, doesn't store as much soil carbon as they said they were going to. That way the broker, buyer, other parties can't come back and, or if they do sue the landowner, the broker has to represent the landowner for that. Of course, traditional um, liability, like we think about, you know, the measurement companies coming out on the property to take those soil core measurements or do vegetation sampling and they get bit by a snake or something that they're fully indemnifying the landowner also require them to uh, cover insurance because that's the your initial and first best line of defense. And then you know, a lot of the other uh, contract terms that are more typical uh, that we see such as, you know, where's the venue gonna be for any disputes? Um, certainly these companies, if they're based in other states, you know, they wanna put it in the venue in that state. And now the venue for any dispute is gonna be where the property is located in that county and the local district court is typically where it's gonna start. The, you certainly wanna reserve the right for a landowner to be able to audit and depending on how the price structures worked out, just, you know, if the broker's paying the landowner, you, the landowner wants to make sure he understands what's happening with the numbers that are going into the landowner's um, paycheck. You know, the ownership of this data, there's potentially a lot of value in what the landowner's secret recipe was if they did store carbon or even if they didn't. And right. the landowner being able to own that data because they were a large participant in it. And you know, there's other considerations such as you know, the taxes uh, from these payments. And mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of other um, parts, I believe, you know, we sort of asked that question in the pamphlet that we put together. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think one of the wise things is, you know, to find in someone like yourself or others from that legal advice, just to talk through it, um, you know, before you sign. And because um, it's, you know, it's a lot of those things you don't know what you don't know. And, and uh, I think those are keys. And, you know, something that we've talked a little bit about already, Anson, both of you and I, which I, I still think is pro possibly one of the most important pieces of all of this is really who do you engage with? right? So if you've thought through all of these considerations and you want to explore these markets, you know, how can you really tell if the group is essentially legitimate? The number one most important thing at the end of the day is who are you partnering with? Uh, granted, contracts can be assigned, but, you know, typically if you can get a pretty good sense from them up front, whether they're in it for the long haul or they're looking to build it and flip it. And that's, it just goes back to asking the question, taking time to have a relationship uh, with the company. The, typically the first person that approaches you from that company is fairly low on the totem pole and they may not even have a good relationship or, or a long relationship with the higher ups at that company that really had the big vision. And so, you know, getting to develop those that personal interaction with the company themselves to do your due diligence. Um, what do they know the science? What are does it seem like this is they're just salesmen, or do they truly believe in the concept of soil carbon storage and the value that it creates? You know, how well do they understand the science? Do they you know, have their a team of their own scientists, you know, or, or are they just sort of a shell corporation? Um, there are a lot of questions out there that want, and I think probably one of the biggest indicators is you go to them with the, you know, landowner terms, which are reasonable and which are, you know, in, for my clients, you know, if they can't get past a certain couple of upfront questions, a sort of letter of intent, then that's a non-starter and we're, everybody's best served by moving on. If you can get with those and really work with the group to develop a, contract that both parties are comfortable with to me that's a very good indicator of a good partner that you want to continue to work with yeah all great 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 thoughts 
you know, lastly, what's your biggest piece of advice for landowners? Have a long-term view mm -hmm. of where you're going um, so that you have, you can fully consider the opportunities from this contract uh, because I think it's a tremendous opportunity for a lot of these ranchers to hop in early on, but you certainly don't want to be in a position where you're trying to do something different with a portion of the property, whether it be develop a solar lease on it, wind lease, um, you're looking to sell it, flip it, anything like that, that would then make having entered into this contract uh, trickier and limit your options. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Anson, for joining us and, and de definitely a, you know, hot topic and, and really appreciate, you know, all your leadership and, and help in this space and, you know, helping our fellow land stewards across the state kind of navigate, um, you know, through these, these markets. Oh, my pleasure. Really appreciate Tall A and M, Noble, Texas Grazing Lands Coalition doing what they've always done, stepping up to assist the landowner. And looking forward to continuing to work with you all. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. And just want to remind uh, folks to visit our Talt's website and download the guide. And and uh, again, please reach out. Um, if you have any questions? Anything we can do? And any of those key partners that Anson mentioned, and we're all here to, to help uh, be, a, you know, be a resource for you. Um, and lastly, just want to remind our, our listeners to rate and review our podcast to help spread the word about working lands conservation. So with that, everybody have a blessed one and look forward to uh, next month's uh, conversation um, from Beyond the Fence Line. Beyond the Fence Line is brought to you by the Texas Agricultural Land Trust dedicated to conserving the Texas heritage of agricultural lands, wildlife habitats, and natural resources. Find out more at txaglandtrust.org.